One more time, if you'll bow with me. Father, come at this time to bring a message. And it's my desire and my hope and my prayer that the message honors you. That though it is my voice, that the message would indeed be yours and would resonate in the places that it needs to. Amen. All right, so this week I wanted to begin kind of where we left off last week. So let me go to, um, yeah, that, there it is, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And we left last week with this thought, that if we would carry these thoughts through our week, that we would find joy, and that if we would think about the things in our life that we could rejoice about, and it's in there twice, and I think there's a reason for that, is we have a hard time sometimes. We get distracted from the joy that we can have in life. See, joy is different from happiness. Often happiness require, is, is dependent on our circumstances, right? If things are going well, I'm happy. If things are going poorly, I'm not. Joy, however, is something that is inside of us that God gives to us. And we can have joy regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So joy, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice and be gentle. You know, there's enough harshness in the world today that we, if we carry a gentle spirit with us into the day, into the week, into our lives, then we're going to see an impact beyond what we're able to do because God will use that to work through us and touch people's lives. And don't worry. Let go of worry. I know I'm one of those that can sometimes worry too much about things. But God says, I got it. I got it. Trust in that. Pray with gratitude. If we focus on the things that we have, if we focus on those positive things in our life, the, the things that are right, the things that are pure, the things that are holy, those things in our life that, that draw us into, into that positive place, that place where we see the good, then we're going to be in better shape than if we focus on the things that we don't. And the interesting thing is that what we focus on, we invariably find. If I spend my time focusing on the things that I don't have, then I'm going to be upset because I don't have them. And I'm just like, oh, this isn't right. It's not fair. But if I focus on the wonderful things in my life that I do have, then my focus is going to be in a, in a whole new and different direction. We are to be peacemakers. We are to bring peace everywhere that we go and, and to seek to do that. And at the end of the day, to always trust God, to trust Jesus, to guard our hearts and to guard our minds. It's going to be a lot of distractions. But if we'll do these things, then we will find joy in our lives. And that's kind of where we left last week. We're getting close, right? You know what today is? December 23rd. It's Christmas Eve Eve. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's the eve of Christmas Eve. We're almost there. It's, it's time to start getting excited, right, Carol? It's time. It's, it's almost here. It's almost Christmas. How cool is that? It's Christmas Eve Eve, Katie. That's, it's awesome. And in this season of the already and not yet that we've been talking about, we're on the verge of celebrating fully and completely this already birth of Jesus, our Christ, our deliverer, our savior, the one who came down from heaven so that we might experience a close relationship with God. This, and this is the continuation of a long told story, been going on a long time. And there's been a lot of twists and turns in it. Throughout the Old Testament, the nation of Israel would do good, then they'd do bad, then they'd do good, then they'd do bad, then they'd do good, then they'd do bad. There's kind of a pattern going on here. Then they'd do good, then they'd do bad, right? If you've read the Old Testament, it kind of goes like, actually it goes, they did good, they did bad, 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 they did good, they did bad, they did bad. That's kind of really how it goes. They didn't do good very much, but, but they would. They'd get it back together and they'd come back around. And, but this has been going on a long time. And our passage from the Old Testament today, because we have an Old Testament passage and a gospel passage, our passage is from a prophet named Micah. And this is out of chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 2 through 5. But you, 
O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth, and the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one who brings peace. He shall be the one who brings peace. See, it's often thought that you've got to be large, you've got to be big. In fact, you've got to be massive, right? Huge. You've got to want to have a huge church. I want to be 12 stone in North Point, only I want to be both of them together and big. That's what I want to, you know. That, that's, how you, that's what you have to do in order to have an impact. But let me go back and repeat this verse. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Israel. And up here it says, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule. In Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient of days. And this is not insignificant for us to recognize. See, here at Arbor Point Church at West Jackson, we want to be a healthy, thriving, growing church. Certainly, I want to fully engage in the ministry to which we're called in our community to inspire others to fulfill the calling that, that they have in their life. That's our purpose, is to inspire people to fulfill the calling you have. And by the way, I say this a lot, but I'm going to keep saying it because it's true. I like saying truth. You have a calling in your life. God has something for you. And you have a calling in your life. And for us here at Arbor Point, it's to, our, our purpose is to inspire people to fulfill that calling that you have. To lead people from where they are to where God would have them to be. That's what we want to be about. That's what we're here for. Uh, but let me be clear. But growth in numbers is not as important as growth of the body of Christ who call this place home. No amens to that, huh? Amen. Let me say it again. Maybe this time, no, 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 it, maybe this time you hear me. You listen? You are? Y'all quiet. Give me a loud amen. amen. All, right, all right, so now I'll say it and then do that again. We'll cut all that out in the video. It'll sound just right. Just kidding. But this is important. See, growth in numbers is not as important as growth of the body of Christ that's here that calls this place, Arbor Point Church at West Jackson, home. Amen. See, that's what we need to be about is encouraging and helping one another to grow, to become who God called you to be. And if we'll do that, the rest of it will take care of itself. But I, now, don't mishear me. I would love for this place to be so full. That we'd have to add a second service, that every chair would be taken. Because that means that there are people in this community who are experiencing the love of Christ the way that we are. And, and it's an incredible when that happens. And I would love to see that, but not for the check mark. Not for the check mark. Because that would allow people to me, to, me and us to engage with more folks who are growing in their faith, becoming who God created. How cool. I get excited about that. That is a cool thing. That's awesome that more people would, would grow and embrace this idea that you don't have to be perfect because we're a group of imperfect people following the one who is perfect, Jesus. That's, that's the deal for us. We get to love on more people. And that's why I preach so often that authentic change is the sign of a life lived for Christ. That we want to be disciples and followers of Jesus, not just fans. We don't want to be on the sideline going, hey, way to go, Jesus, yay! That's not it. Get out of the stand. Get on the field. Because we want to be in the game. Be in the trenches. Because that's where it's happening. Meeting people and reaching people and engaging with people. That's who we want to be. Because that's where Jesus is. And at the end of the day, you know where we want to be? Where he is. That's the deal. If we get to that place. And here's the other thing. See, great things can come from a small group of committed followers. The church started with... Jesus, and then with really 11 disciples and some followers. Now take a look around. Do we have more than 11 people here? Yes. Did you know that there are more people here today in this church than the church started with and billions have been impacted 
by those first who came. Let that fall on you. We have more people here than they had there. I find that incredible. I find that encouraging. If we will do as they did and tell the story, God will move. God will move. Our passage from Micah serves as a preview to the nativity story. Bethlehem and Mary are the recipients of the coming Lord and we're to open the door too. We open the door and welcome the God who has decided to become a resident of our neighborhood, right? He moved in <laughs> to the neighborhood. And God is more fascinated with each one of us than with the throne surrounded with angels and archangels. We don't always think of it that way. God had it all. He didn't have to come down. But he is more enamored with you than with all of that that was going on, and he came here to us. He chose to face all the risks and all the passions of being a human being. And Micah was a, most likely a, a, a Judean prophet during about the eighth century before Christ. And the reason that that's important is that he's given this, this divine oracle to God's covenant people, the, is, the, the nation of Israel, that's around 700 years before the actual birth of Christ. This passage was written centuries before it was fulfilled. And this is the Advent Sunday of love. And we didn't burn the place down. Hallelujah. <laughs> a lot of prayer this morning. And there's a passage that Corey referenced that's really, I think, critical and important for us in the church. But if you've been around me much, you'll see that I, I rarely will separate 316 from 317. Because they must go together in my mind. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But hear this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And too often we just do the love part and we forget the other part. The other part is critical for us. This week's uh, word in the lectionary, the the. the scriptural or the, the series pattern that, that I'm working from, the word for this Sunday is welcome. Welcome. See, we're getting close to the coming of the Messiah. We're just a few days away from the birth of Jesus and the celebration of that. So the image of the manger is becoming more and more our focus. The days of sorrow and judgment and other things, the doom and gloom that we've been talking about and, and referencing from the Old Testament prophets, that's beginning to go to the rearview mirror. It's back here. And now we're beginning to look forward, this joyous expectation that we have that, that Christ is coming, Christ is coming, the birthday is coming, Christmas is coming, the present is coming. And, and we get to get excited about that. And for us in the church, this celebration is meant to be shared and we are to welcome one another on this journey of faith we are to be welcoming on this journey it's filled with so we lit four candles right you know what they what they represent there's the candle of hope we have such a hope in christ and and we light that candle to remind us that we get to carry that hope with us into the world and then we lit the candle of peace because we are peacemakers blessed are the peacemakers and, and, and we even put on the, 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 um, the shoes of peace, so to speak, when we put on the armor of God, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, so that we can carry that peace with us into all circumstances. And then we, we, we lit the candle. What was last week? Joy. Yes, the candle of joy, because we get to carry that joy with us and, and today it's about love and when we bring all of these things together we begin to see the Christian life we begin to see this amazing love and uh, that we have that was given to us the God that we have and that we're to share and I've said it time after time after time after time we must share this love it will not transfer by osmosis if if Think of it this way. Remember those 11 that I referenced? What if they just said, well, I hope people figure out that I'm a Christian just by the way that I'm living. What would have happened? 
Not much. So we have a story to tell. And this idea of sharing the story of God is one that we get too bound up with. Share what God's doing in your life. That's it. You don't have to go, oh, I'm sorry. Thomas, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Let me tell you about him. Now, if you want to do that, go ahead. But I would prefer it. But, you know, you know, what God has done in my life is incredible, Thomas. I, I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. And he took me from that. And he brought me to a place where today I get to share his love to a congregation of people. I get to be involved with literally hundreds of, in, my, in my recovery with hundreds and, and thousands of addicts and alcoholics over a course of 28 years. It's incredible what God has done. It's incredible what he's done in my life. It's incredible what he'll do in your life. You have a story. Be willing to share it. To just read that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life is not the fuller message from John. There's an important more to the story. As Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story now for the rest of the story that's right and the rest of the story is for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that through him the world might be saved that means we must remain and always be a place of saving not of condemning a place of loving others that the world considers less than or least or perhaps imperfect and loving those folks. Remember that line in the sand that, you know, the, that um, Nadia Boltz Weber's husband is that, you know, I hate that. We draw a line in the sand. Jesus is always on the other side of the line. We got to wipe that stuff out and step across the line and go, okay, I want to be where Jesus is. So I'm going to step across the line. And I know it's uncomfortable because I may not, I may not look like, feel like, uh, act like, or, or know who those, who those people are. And we got to step across the line so that we can become just, you know, so we can build those relationships and become who we're called to be. And I want to connect this as well. Paul wrote this in Romans 8.1. He said, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is not part of what Jesus came to do. John 3.17, firmly, I did not send my son into the world to condemn it. Paul follows it up with, there is therefore no condemnation. How much condemnation? None for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you got a condemnation voice going on and I got one who lives back here who tries to beat me up, that is not from God. That is not from God. That can be an old voice of ours, but most likely it's our enemy trying to drag us down. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that tells us that God is serious about the need for us to stand against condemnation when we see it. When we see that and other folks are condemning, we need to stand against that so that we can stand for salvation. So what does that look like? Well, I'm going to give that focus on the six o'clock series. I'm going to talk about for us here at Arbor Point Church more what that looks like. But let's leave it with the fact that it looks a lot like following in Jesus's footsteps. Going to places where he went, reaching anyone and everyone that he would if we were walking right behind him. It means loving like he loves all those that he loves. It means being in harmony with God's concern for the least of these. To warmly welcome those who visit our church, of course. But also to warmly welcome those that we bump into in the world. Our, and by the way, some of them are in our family. I don't know about you. I got people in my family I don't particularly care for. Amen. <laughs> But I got to love them because I want to be like Jesus. I want to I want to follow the path that he puts before me. See, there are those who are thirsting for the love, the fellowship, the hope, all of those things, the counsel that, that Jesus gives to me. I want to share that with others. We, we're to serve as volunteers wherever we can from visiting nursing homes and hospitals and helping out at ISERB or the Good News Club on Thursday nights to providing for foster children to rebuilding a broken down deck. Amen. And so on and on and on, right? That's we're to go to the places that Jesus goes because that's part of our calling. That's what we're asked to do. There's a song that Corey Asbury sings. And I want to close the message with it. 
Because I think it's important to hear this. The words will be up there if you want to see. But please let this resonate. Before I spoke the words, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. himself is reckless. He's not crazy. We are, however, saying that the way he loves in many regards is quite so. And what I mean is this. God is utterly unconcerned with the consequences of his actions with regards to his own safety, comfort, and well-being. His love isn't crafty or slick. It's not cunning or shrewd. In fact, all things considered, it's quite childlike. Might I even suggest sometimes his love is downright ridiculous. His love bankrupted heaven for you and for me. His love doesn't consider himself first. It isn't selfish or self-serving. He doesn't wonder what he's going to gain or lose by putting himself on the line. He simply puts himself out there on the off chance that maybe you and I will look back and give him that love in return. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me, sing it. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, 
mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. Let me tell you something. Do you know that light takes away darkness every time? That when we turn the lights on, it doesn't matter how dark it is in here because that light will push the darkness away. If you've got darkness in your life, know that God's light will push it away. Just reach out to Him. He'll take it. He'll run with it. He'll take you where you need to go. There's no wall out there that He won't tear down to come and find you. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. He wants to be a part of every aspect of who you are. Let Him. Let Him. Sing it. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me, that's right. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming never. Love of God, yes, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leads the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. You know. I've been the one, I've been the sheep, I've been the one that, that was gone and lost and he left the 99 to come find me. And if you're the one, know that he will leave, he will come find you where you are. He loves you beyond measure. Let him love you. Let him love you. Amen.